Thank you, Ulrike. Everybody was listening intensely. We've got 900 listeners by now, more than 900. So let me point out, we can't read in the chat what's going on. And uh, those who want to contribute to the discussion directly, please press F and A on the bottom of your screen, click there and enter your questions there. And we'll try to collect them here and make them part of the discussion. Uh, from There's a direct response from Nina Troy from Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie based in Leipzig, where the post-growth conference, which was called something else, as I said, uh, took place or where it stopped. It's something that uh, is recurring globally. So, Nina, maybe you could explain what it is that you do before you then uh, talk about uh, concepts of new and other economies. Nina. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for your introduction and for your invitation. And Ulrike, thank you very much for this exciting presentation. I took the liberty of having a look at the chat function again and again, which was exploding, really. And I'll respond to some of these things because I've thought about them. One thing about this new economy, we are trying to find concepts for a new social and ecological and democratic economy. We're working together with social movements, trying to build a bridgehead between what science tells us and the practice of social movements. And we organized this big Congress and are working on things now like post-growth and degrowth, not only under this name. We also use the expression future for all. I agree with Ulrike on many points. One important thing I don't agree with is I'm not a fan of capitalism. In fact, I'm a critic of capitalism, and I think 80% of our listeners will be that. But I think we need to make a change, and the question is how to get there. My first point is the situation is often read as a ecological analysis, but we've learned if we want to overcome post-colonial conditions and want sovereign development and self-determined lives everywhere in the world, then we need to overcome capitalism and to overcome the global uh, governing uh, conditions. So one discourse is degrowth, um, an international discourse which comes very much from the post-colonial discourse. And it was said the roots of wealth in the global north are in the exploitation of the global south. This was pointed out in the chat very much. Why was there this wealth in England? Uh, why did they have this textile production? Well, because of exploitation and slavery in the south. I don't know whether this is so, but the current situation which we have and the roots of modern capitalism are based on exploitation, not just of nature, but also of people, especially in the global south. So the basic objective was of degrowth is not just stopping climate change, but creating good living conditions worldwide. And as Ulrike pointed out, this green shrinkage also means equalizing living conditions worldwide. It would mean fair trading conditions would mean creating space of powerful economic development in the global south. And the situation that we are in now means there must be an in unequal division of labor. There must be some countries that supply cheap raw materials with very cheap labor. And these raw materials are then used in the, south, in the north at very good prices. And the development path which is being taken in the south that has made emerging countries from India and China is very much based on industrial development. The same thing that happened in Europe, that is taking land, that is commons, that were managed together, that were used for agriculture, are now fenced in, are privatized. The population doesn't have any land anymore to work on. It can't do farming anymore and is turned into the proletariat which is needed for these companies to be active. And this is exactly what is happening in the global south. One example in Indochina, in, in, in China there are many 
special e economic zones where factories are being built and land is being taken and the people who don't have any land anymore cannot afford any different life need to work in these factories. So growth always brings wealth for only a few is at very high cost. It's at the cost of self-determined and sovereign lives, lives which are still connected to the land. I, I don't want to romanticize this, but I mean people who used to do peasant farming are quite differently connected to the place where they're living than people working in a factory who were simply attracted to this place. So we're not just talking about climate change and the living conditions here, but we're looking at global things. So the question is, who is really aided by growth? And who would benefit from our overcoming the current economic uh, situation? And now what's very important for us, and you've written a lot about this, Ulrike, that we need to be afraid for jobs because those who will then descend socially will turn to the right. It's not that, or, or their fe fears will make them. So we need to bring about social peace without redistribution. So that part of the pie of those who are most exploited is very small. So as long as if the whole pie is growing, you can say you can also rise, you can uh, fly because flights are so cheap. And now we've reached the limits of the pie the limits of the planet, it's not working anymore. We can't maintain social peace by maintaining this promise of constant growth. And this brings us to the conflicts which we see quite clearly. You can see it in the environmental movement. The unions say we need to maintain the industrial jobs and the others say industrial jobs are not the future. I don't want to play up the one against the other, but we need to conduct this discussion. How did we benefit from the current system, that is we, the people in the global north, people in Germany, and what kind of jobs do we want to maintain, so to speak, and how can we? After all, there are people who have fears. How, how can we work together on this? And the anti-growth movement says they want exactly this social transformation. How do we get from capitalism to green shrinking? As Thomas Seibert said in his introduction, at the times of the pandemic, we are not returning to what was before. We don't want to get to what was before, but we can make use of the pandemic to get social and ecological policies started. And Eric Ollenfeit, a, a US socialist, just Ways Out of Capitalism is this book, and is his book, and he points out three strategies. The first one is reforms. The classical symbiosis with the government, that's what social democracy does. Then there's building separate structures, making use of free spaces. This is a classical anarchist approach. And thirdly, saying we need to change things very much. There needs to be a cut and a revolution, a communist revolution. All these strategies have created their benefits, but none of them has made it. And now he says, in all parts, we must bring them together. So I support this. We need revolutionary, real politicians, politicians who are starting out from the present system and how do we get to this shrinking of the pie that Ulrich pointed out. But we also need to build new structures, self-organized structures, where people can com be committed, where they can do things locally. But we also need to ask in principle, what kind of a state do we want to live on, live in? How do we want to really redistribute power and political conditions? So examples would be radical cutting of working hours to something like 20 hours, a redistribution of work, and also redistribution of wages for the lower wage earners, redistribution by taxes, massive redistribution of what there is in order to invest it in 
uh, this reconstruction and how these sectors like the car industry on which wealth, for example, in Germany is dependent very much, how we can change this so that not lots and lots of people are using losing their jobs all of a sudden. But uh, what has been done so far was far too slow. It needs to be done together with the workforce and with unions and not just to do it top down. To, to conclude this, as Ulrike said, the government is strong and can act, but it depends on how high the pressure is. Where does this pressure come from? What kind of cooperation do we need to build in order to bring about this pressure? Question, where does this pressure come from? Let me ask you this. Who will put on this pressure? We've had this discussion, and Ulrike mentioned this, this discussion about agriculture, industrialized agriculture is one driver of the climate crisis and there's this big and huge movement which is cr growing as we've just seen there were demos although they were just virtual but uh, it was big and there was a forum because in a virtual format of course you can get a lot more people into virtual space as in our situation here we would need a tremendous auditorium to uh, accommodate the 1,000 people who are on the me meeting at the moment, or 918 to be precise. But agriculture is going on and on, and it's getting worse and worse. I come from the north, and in the north it was dry for three years. Our trees are dying. Agriculture is dying, but there is no change. So what to do, Ulrike or Nina? Well, Ulrike could speak, I've just spoken. Well, I think this pressure will mount. Simply, once the damage becomes more and more visible, at some point in time, even the last will notice that climate change is really an extreme problem. So the point will rather be, as always really, that people will react too late. Not now, when you could still prevent the world from heating up by two more degrees. I think people will only wake up once we've reached three degrees. And I think it's not so clear to many. I mean, it's clear to people here on the forum, but not many have understood this. Climate change is a dynamic process. So people say, well, in the worst case, it will be two degrees and we can take that risk because we always have this discussion about two degrees by 2050. But that it certainly has to be stopped or you'll get to eight degrees or nine degrees or whatever, this has not been understood yet. The attitude still is in the majority of the population, this idea that in some way we can discuss with nature, saying, well, our capitalism does need growth, so unfortunately we can't protect nature which is complete garbage, this approach. But it hasn't been understood, but this pressure will come by itself only. It will probably be too late. So if I may, I would like to return to two points that Nina made, with which I really disagree. And I think this is what many people on the chat function are moved by very much. The question, does capitalism as a system necessarily need exploitation. And this is not an issue. There's so much exploitation the world over and endless violence. But the question is of t central importance, especially for the left. Are these political decisions or is it an economic necessity? And from my point of view, it's all political decisions and not an economic necessity. In order to give you some examples to make this clear, I'll, and I'll, then I'll tell you what I deduce from this. Nina said, ultimately, capitalism needs colonies. From my point of view, well, of course, many industrialized countries had colonies for some time. But from my point of view, for the economic system and economic growth in these countries, it didn't mean so much. To give you a few historical examples, the first big colonial powers in Europe were Portugal and Spain, and their colonies for both countries have meant 
that Portugal and Spain were impoverished and still today, 500 years later, have not been able to catch up with the northern industrialized countries, which never had uh, colonial empires to speak of. There are other countries that still have colonies and that didn't make any progress. The best example is Russia. Russia is the biggest empire that still exists. I mean, it's not that European Russians would have lived in Vladivostok in the past. It's all been colonial uh, conquests since the Middle Ages. And although Russia has so many raw materials, little is happening. Everybody knows the Russians are lagging behind. And China, China also had colonies, if you will, Tibet and the Uyghurs and so on, and it was no use to the Chinese. They've never become capitalist in the actual sense of the world until they began importing Western technology. So colonies don't take you anywhere, really. The same is true for slavery. We hadn't talked about this, but it's correct. 11 million Africans were taken to North America and South America. What's not so much mentioned is 4 million Africans at the same time in the 15th to 19th century were taken to North Africa, to the Ap Arab countries, to the Middle East and so on. And no capitalism emerged there. And we could go on and on with this. From slavery and colonialism, you don't get to capitalism or it would be no puzzle why it emerged in England, of all places, and around 1760. And in fact, at exactly the same time when capitalism emerged in England, they lost their biggest colony, the US. And this is good news for the left, that capitalism does not necessarily have exploitation as its precondition, because if it was so, there wouldn't have been any opportunity for shaping things politically because we would have had to overcome capitalism first to achieve anything. But once you understand that capitalism doesn't need exploitation, in fact it works better as a system if there's no exploitation, then there is the freedom for shaping things politically. And especially the people on the left should know this, that this freedom exists. Well, that's good news, so to speak. In other words, high wages are good for capitalism. If you believe in this, to put it quite harshly, that exploitation is a necessity, then you are in the same position as the neoliberals, as a leftist. They're also, also saying again and again we need to reduce wages. And then raw materials. What Nina said is not right, I think. It's correct that the industrialized countries are trying to get the raw materials as cheaply as possible. But this is really to their own disadvantage. Look at what's happening when things are going differently. Everybody learned this in the 1970s when there were the oil price shocks, oil was much more expensive afterwards than before. And quite seriously, this didn't damage the industrialized countries. What happened was the oil exporting countries with their new income started shopping in the West. I mean, whichever way you la find it, that the Saudis bought Mercedeses like mad and helicopters and so on. But this only shows what the flows are, this idea of paying for a raw material, paying a lot of money, and then the money has disappeared in the well. It's no longer with me. That's nonsense. It flows back to be spent over here. So the effect of the expensive raw materials, and everybody can only welcome this, was that they started using oil more efficiently. And it would be like this with all raw materials. If they became more expensive, then ways would be found of using them more efficiently and the money spent on them would come back because it could be used for consumption. Uh, A brief answer by Nina, please. And then I'd like to ask uh, Moritz to let us know the questions and comments that came in through the chat. Nina. Now. I do understand the need that we want to clarify things here where we have a different view on, and I understand that it's important to understand the essence of capitalism. My key message wasn't that there'll always be colonies in capitalism. My message was the way 
the organization of labor is organized, it's based on exploitation and violence in the South. Now, we can discuss whether that could be overcome in capitalism, but that's not the point. No, 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 that wasn't my point. My point was there are very unjust labor conditions and conditions of life, and we need to see how to organize that better. And there are many people in the global South who can profit from reorganizing it. That's my point. And let me try, sorry, sorry for interjecting here, because we had a third panelist planned for this morning here. This would have been Disha from India, who represents and supports small farmers with her organization in their protest of exactly what you described, Nina. That's a major protest movement currently in India, but Disha's organization's lawyers told her to, because the organization is under a lot of political and legal pressure because of their support for small farmers, they asked her to refrain from giving public statements and just uh, shut up internationally, so to speak, for her to not end up in prison. That is why Disha isn't here today. Now, Nina again. Yes, I mentioned this yesterday, and I think Ulrike and I are discussing it in an entirely different way than we would be discussing if there was an Indian representative here representing the Global South. Now, my point was, we have a large interest of overcoming this, these exploitation situations, and I would like to strike the bridge to other debates we're going to have today, because with degrowth, I think it's not just about overcoming the economic situations and circumstances, it's about overcoming the current um, situations of power. And there's rules of power between North and South, it's a patriarchal rule often, it's a system of able-bodied versus um, disabled. And another thing, Ulrike, in capitalism there doesn't have to be exploitation. Exploitation happens at the moment where there are private share owners of companies and the others can only ever go along. It's not a cooperative, a joint, a democratic organization, but it's a top-down decision. And then you can say, okay, cooperative, let's appoint somebody as a managing director, but I'd say that's where exploitation starts already. We can talk longer about the concept of what exploitation means, but that's inherent in a hierarchical capitalist structure. That would be the discussion about commons, as I mentioned earlier, and that's an important discussion that might bring us further, especially if we look at agriculture again. Also, Rika, what you said earlier. Obviously, an ecologization of agriculture, for example, would provide many, many more jobs if we don't do it all with these self-operating robots. May I say another word on actors of change? It's not a 10-minute uh, speech, it's just a minute. That was the starting question, after all. And I'd say, we saw the government can be strong in acting, and it's not, our green shrinking won't happen out of capitalism, and it would be the power of social movements and people who request this and take it to the streets. Ulrike said, there is no party which does not advocate green growth. I'd say there are anti-capitalist parties who do not advocate green growth, but that's another different debate. But I think agriculture and farming, it's good to see that a lot of change is going on at the moment. On the one hand, there's the very strong resistance against ecological versions of state-dictated agriculture, but there's now also environmental actors and associations coming together in order to see what's their joint interests in removing these very poor working conditions of farmers. And that is a very strong power in seeing how we can get together these joint interests. That's what the discussion is really all about, and Moritz Kravinkel will now summarize for us what came in through the chat while we were chatting ourselves. Let me try. It's anything but easy. It's a heated debate in the chat and in the F&A, but I think I can distinguish two lines of uh, argument here. One is questions to do with the historic and global perspective, and the other is questions for alternatives. Maybe we can set that aside for a minute because there's a lot of need for discussion regarding the analysis of capitalism and the roots of capitalism and the question of exploitation. That's what emerges in the chat and in the questions. Now, to pick out one as, sim uh, as symptomatic, maybe, it's this here. 
isn't it oversimplifying asking the dichotomous question of whether capitalism requires exploitation or not, or whether it might not be political actors ensuring exploitation? And couldn't we state without problems that a capitalist system of a neoliberal um, trend is extremely beneficial to exploitation? And under that heading, would it be a perspective that this can be reformed at all, or is that something that can't be done in any way? So that's one trend of questions where great many people look at colonialism and the historic perspective of colonialism that they presented and asked whether not at least at the very roots, the great riches coming from the colonies and by exploiting the people kept in slavery, whether that was not a major contributor to the first massive growth of capitalism. It sounds a bit like a question of whether capitalism can be reformed. That's how you worded it. And Ulrike Herrmann, I didn't understand you to say at the beginning that you said capitalism can be reformed. I think the heading of your presentation could be the end of capitalism rather, right? Because it would be a different system already that's being requested there. Yes, do you want me to answer? Okay. Well, those asking the questions in the chat, I can understand. The question is why, or oh, that's what I understand it to mean, why go into history as to what was important and what wasn't? Why can't we simply take the, part, the present and uh, look into the future. And as I said, I, I do understand that line of argument and of questioning. That I keep referring back to history is for three reasons. One's a personal one. I am a historian, um, so that always takes you back into history. Secondly, I think it is important, first of all, to clarify the term capitalism. Everybody has a slightly different notion of it. So I find it always helpful to take a step back and look at how did it come about and what really characterizes it. And thirdly, I believe we, uh, or I want to make very clear how strong the connection is between growth and capitalism. And that is why I believe that it needs to be overcome. And to me, the very central problem of capitalism is growth. Capitalism necessarily needs growth in order to remain stable. Other things that Nina put forward, exploitation, suppression of the global south and so on, all of those are problems that I also see, but they could also be solved within capitalism. Question of political pressure, of course, self-empowerment and so on and so forth. I'm not saying it's trivial, but it would work within such a system. So. The actual systematic que question would be degrowth or shrinking. Yes, correct. Shrinking, shrinking and growth, those are the central issues when we look at climate neutral approaches. Essentially, I want to keep this lean, so to speak, because experience has shown if you want to sh change everything big time with a revolution at best, then the probability of failing is extremely high simply looking at real pol real life politics. That's why I'm focusing on the core problem as I see it. But that, Nina, is uh, pre precisely the problem that you're pointing out here. Degrowth, shrinking, really. Although we mustn't call it that, I know that. Well, I don't know if you call it green healthy shrinking, I don't know. One reason why we often use degrowth as a term is that it's a term which can't be co-opted so easily, which the other side can't uh, occupy so easily. Sustainability, that's what every company claims to do. So shrinking the economy, I don't think that's something which, which uh, the actors of social modern market economy are easy to put forward. Although the word says something else. I mean, degrowing is not... This might be something different. And Nina, yes, degrowth is kind of a construct, a, a kind of strange term, but it's stronger than post-growth. But maybe I can interject something here. Because this term is so difficult as such, and that's why Ulrike was trying to explain what was behind it, we prefer to work with utopias and narratives as to where do we want to go. 
I think that's quite fitting too. If you want to get out of capitalism, often people aren't aware of what's the central thing they're supposed to change. Yeah, doing away with the separation between work and capital, companies to be taken over into the hands of their uh, workforce, uh, what about the division of labor and so on. I was at a trade union meeting yesterday where a professor said, well, we will not be able to overcome capitalism over a period of 10 years. So not as of today in 10 years, but generally within a period of 10 years. And I'm wondering, can we overcome capitalism unless it's in a very short period of time, given the division of labor, global financial markets and so on? I would care for Ulrike's opinion on that. In, isn't it more realistic to take government planned and uh, mandated shrinking periods um, given out external circumstances and push it through worldwide rather than trying to do it in Germany only? Moderator, let's not make it a bilateral discussion here, but let's also come to the second point Moritz uh, gave us from the chat so that we can open it up to the forum participants as well. Moritz. Yes, referring to alternatives, there are three aspects which uh, I've distilled here as interesting. One is the term of the imperial way of life, if we use that and if we consider ourselves actors as the imperial way of life in the global north, then how can we create a change in awareness to be translated into actual action? Second aspect, the question of how can degrowth or shrinking be implemented in a democratic manner and thinking about it, uh, planned economy being the term here, is that where we would need to go in order to be able to control it differently and still remain democratic in it? And third aspect, the question for already existing alternatives, partially in the Global South, to be brought into the debate and what role such approaches could play, when we be, for example in the analysis on the question of how it could go on. Okay, great, then let's uh, continue here. How can the change in awareness or attitude be brought about? I mean, we're in the COVID crisis now, um, as we're all aware, and we've seen how all of a sudden the state, the government can intervene and interfere and how they can force or do economic production and be responsible for it. All of these are things which uh, in the neoliberal past would have been considered uh, miserable and now in the crisis that's really the only option as it seems to us. So can we learn something from that maybe? How to democratically bring about such a change? Nina, that's exactly what you're working on, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think we've stressed this a number of times. What's to be learned from it is that the government can Act, be a strong actor if there's need for it and if there's the understanding and readiness to accept that in the population. That's always the question. To what extent is the need for the government to act uh, recognized on the government side and how ready is the population to accept that? And also, as Arika said, the population is always lagging behind, so to speak, and that's an important starting point. For about 10 years, I feel, I've been talking on post-growth and I think there's been a shift. The questions are now different, people are better informed, there's more feedback and it's being discussed in different forums as well. I mean, it's not as if it had arrived in the mainstream, say, but there's more awareness. And there's a large majority that at least questions and criticizes capitalism and doesn't see it as the system for the future. And that quickly brings us to the question of what have we got to lose and how can we take our industrial, highly work-divided uh, society to make sure we don't lose too much. And that's where the government needs to go into discussion with the people who are affected by it. It's not the manager uh, to uh, push this through, but it's rather talking about the workforce, say, of the large-scale corporation and finding solutions of where do we want to go and also see what do we have to gain when overcoming this imperial way of life. I mentioned shortening labor times or working times. One limit of growth is not just the ecological component, but also the time factor. 
all our days have 24 hours only. If there's ever more, ever more information, ever more channels on which we document, sometimes we won't cope intellectually. So people stand a lot to gain if they are simply given more time. So time wealth, if you want. You could do that by shortening working times and rebuilding the industrialized society. That was a long way of answering the question. I'll address the second part later. Ulrike. OK, let me give or answer the three questions that were mentioned here. Shrinking in a democratic way, how can that work? And that is why I so much like the British war economy as an interesting example, because the British, as we all know, have been democratic all the time. It wasn't a war dictatorship, after all. So strong government intervention can be done in a democratic way. And that takes us to the second question, the imperial way of life. Climate change, obviously, is something else than Hitler knocking at your door. Well, it depends on how you see it. If you see it as a catastrophe, yes, yes, but that's the argument I'm often confronted with. Hitler was a person uh, which was a visible, tangible danger. And of course, it's a massive difference. The British were convinced that they'd win the Second World War. and. They were right, after all. So the perspective was, OK, let's uh, do this for five years, and then we'll continue growth, and everything will be like before. And the real fundamental difference, one's got to grant that and can't be denied, is that in the long run, and probably forever, one would then have to bid farewell to the growth concepts as we had them. Climate change poses entirely different challenges. Now, the question, it will work, it can work in democratic terms if everybody's convinced of that there is a catastrophe about to happen. Second question, I like that too, the imperial way of life. That's a fact, whether it's capitalist induced or not, that's a fact. And another fact is we live at the expense of others. And I understood the question to mean what would the population, what would stop the population in the West from continuing like that in the future? So we use up the three planets and it'll all work out okay because Africa, as we know it, consumes less than one. So they're not fully using up their share. So that's super, let's keep it up because we profit from the injustice. And that's exacerbated the question goes to the very core because, unfortunately, the North that produces all of the climate gases and emissions at the same time is not so strongly affected, affected by climate change. But I believe that this kind of injustice in the long term still won't work out because although Germany, geographically speaking, is uh, well positioned, far in the North, tends to be cooler and so on, and we also still have water, albeit less than before, but even we, are reached by climate change. We experience climate change. I mean, you can see the example pretty much everywhere, and it mustn't be underestimated. The German forest is going to die. I expect over the last ten, next 10 years. So if you want to have some forest experience, you'd better go out for a walk right now. Because I can't see how the different types of trees uh, are to survive it. And then the forest is gone. It's not the end of vegetation, but the forest will be gone. And that's just the beginning of climate change. So I believe this notion of climate change taking place somewhere else, and to put it cynically, in Africa preferably, and here we've got our brave new world, no, that's simply nonsense. So there'll be entirely new negotiation options and concepts to be thought up because, and that was also mentioned by somebody, I think it was Nina, and that's quite right, all of that can be solved only at a global level. And if I was focusing on Germany in my presentation, then it was just to allow for an analysis of what need, would need to be done. But it can't be resolved on a national basis. And then it takes us to the question that was also asked. Approaches in the global south, south when we were and so on. All of that is extremely important. I do believe, and also Nina covered that, uh, utopias and so on. But I believe that in discussing this, one needs to distinguish two things, which constantly get blurred and mixed. Maybe not so much by the one asking the question, certainly not by Nina, but in my experience, it always gets mixed up. One is the objective of what this cyclic recycling economy could look like, shorter working times, gender equality, when we vir, and the lot. And all of these visions, they work. The only problem, the problem is not the vision. The problem is the way to get there. 
and I can only repeat myself here, how can we the take the dynamically growing capitalism and taking to the shrinking cyclic economy without there being an economic crisis in the middle with millions of people unemployed who are all worried about their income? And this question of transformation, that is as yet unresolved. And it's no use declaring visions as transformation because you still don't have the transformation answer then. And I think the only thing to do is strong government planning globally with rationing. But there we go. And I haven't yet read anything else that might work out. Yeah. Of course, there are some examples from the global south, if I include India. There's, for example, one state in India, it's not a large one, which decided let's do without all pesticides and let's turn over to organic farming and it's working. It's the only state in which this is the case seamlessly with 100% organic farming in a peasant structure. And I think this is one possibility that we could at least think about to some extent. And Switzerland is voting on this, whether they should give up pesticides. So these are ways, uh, at least, of getting out of the industrialization of agriculture. Well, if I may come in on this, I think it's extremely important to see the alternatives created by people locally, because there will not be any solution which will fit everywhere in the world. So it's a totally exciting question, how can post-growth or climate justice here or feminist networks here, how can they connect with others the world over? And a lot is happening. And here, degrowth as a word doesn't mean a lot to many people, but when we're talking about harmonizing global living conditions, bringing about juster conditions. I think that's something that we can certainly link up with the struggle in the global south or justice in India, which was used as an example several times. I'm not quite, I, I, I'm not quite with Ulrike on her vision and transformation. I know what you mean if we say and uh, describe the future as something completely beautiful, but we need to get there but we should act guided by visions. And I don't think we can develop a vision which we can simply implement. I mean, if you have this great peaceful vision and develop this and want to bring it about with a violent revolution and wage war for a long time, then you have a completely different society and not a blooming society. So the way there would have to be a peaceful way in which civil disobedience plays an important role in order to carry out conflicts, but uh, that's not violent. And we talked a lot about what are people, I mean people, humans, the population, what they are willing to do and what do they see. And here, narratives and visions are so important by pointing out how good things could be, not just saying the whole world is doing badly, climate change is completely bad, but to say what can we win? What can we develop? So in a project like Future for All that I mentioned, you get these things like a lot more people would be have to be in farming, but what would be the working conditions? It shouldn't be conditions in which you don't have any time left. So what kind of farming should it be? We need to ans ask these questions to get a good transformation. Now in the background, Moritz has collected a few people who raised their hands and would like to speak online. Is this the case, Moritz? No, not so far. Okay, let me repeat it then. You can also raise your hands now and speak on the online meeting so that at least a few of you, just a few, will be visible. So if you raise your hands now, you can contribute to the discussion. But let's first of all stick to the contradiction that you spoke about, Nina and Ulrike. How do you see the way to get there? Nina, you said, there's growing awareness. This was one question, how to get to this change in awareness. There is this growing awareness. You register this and you also register growing knowledge. 
about different ways of economic activity, but it's not a major movement yet that can uh, put on a lot of pressure. Well, I mentioned three axes. Finding ways, a planned economy rationing. Well, I mean targeted steps by the government, like a tax reform, like starting with changing over the car industry, uh, overcoming coal and so on. There's not so much trust that a black and green government would achieve this. We've spoken about ecologic modernization. This is more the program of the Greens, trying to maintain jobs in industry and greenwash them. So, But it would be a good leftist government policy project for a red and green government, maybe. We need to find people who are willing to experiment with different ways of doing the economy. We wouldn't have these renewable energies if people hadn't started at the grassroots tinkering with these new energies. So we need uh, cooperatives forming local distribution networks, social farming. These are examples. And then we need powerful social movements which fight these fights on the ground. Now, you said we don't have this, but unfortunately we're in a lockdown in the corona pandemic. And I think in this year, with the lots of elections in Germany, and in view of the climate crisis, and with the critical point in time, there will be major fights this summer in health, in climate, so that people will take to the streets. Well, one thing at least is that the hospitals will go bankrupt in the COVID crisis because the system is based on flat payments per case. And if somebody stays in hospital for three months with COVID, then they won't get any money. Yes, these flat payments per case have been criticized for years. We need to get out of this system. And there could be a system in which hospitals, when they have a lot to do, which serves the survival of society, in which hospitals do not have to be bankrupted. So they shouldn't be commercialized. So we need to change the system about hospitals. Well, we could start with this. It would be one starting point because of the COVID crisis. Yes, and which shows quite brutally, we're discussing ICU beds, but uh, we see that there are not enough ICU nurses. There's this brutal shortage of hospital workers be because the conditions are so bad that nobody wants to do it anymore. So we need to change the health system and need to increase the value valuation of, uh, of work in this f field. Ulrike. Well, going back, I don't want to discuss the health system, although I would have a lot to say about it, but it takes us away from the overall topic if we were to discuss the German health system. I wanted to get back to your idea. India, 100% small farmers, farming structure, it's great, but we know, and you can calculate this quite easily, if the world was to produce organically, which would have to be the target, then you wouldn't have the volumes of uh, grain and soy in order to support the meat consumption of the world. So the first thing that everybody could do, in fact, and you can gauge by it how serious the overall population is about this, is stopping to eat meat. End of story. Becoming a vegetarian is a necessary precondition for farming to be ecological. The vegetarianism won't work, I can only tell you that. Because eggs are produced by chicken. I can live quite well without eggs, I know. You'd have to calculate then how much milk can still be produced or not. But certainly, as long as people go on eating meat, you can be certain that they're not so serious about it. Yes, it has to do with the volumes consumed and with the question, what amount of product is made here and how much is being imported. We, in Europe, in the European Union, are using 
an agricultural area the size of France. It also has to do with our exporting. Germany is exporting meat, that's complete madness and import soy. So a lot could be changed, a lot could be done. Would this be an approach? Because at times of COVID, we are talking a lot about food. Well, maybe we should take the questions of, of, of our viewers. Well, Ulrike, you are pointing out again and again that people can decide for themselves. But here you say it's absolutely necessary that people turn vegetarians. But I know a lot of people who say that doesn't matter. We need to change the structures. I find it a bit tricky to insist on this. Well, that's a good thing. Let me respond to this. That's a very important objection, an interesting objection. Nina is quite right. I pointed out if we all start reducing consumption without agreeing on this, then only the economy will collapse. Why is it different on meat and in farming? It has two reasons. In fact, consumers have enormous leverage in farming. The first thing, only 267,000 people are working in farming in Germany. It's a very, very small sector. And if you change its structure, it will not immediately pull down the rest of the economy. Everybody knows this. And everybody knows that farming in Germany is producing 14% of greenhouse gases. So it's few people with big ecologic footprint. I didn't even mention the tying of the insects. And the second thing is farming is subsidized by governments and regulated by governments. We have this government influence anyway. So if we were to convert this, the parties involved and the value chains wouldn't be in any difficulties because it's a planned economy anyway at a European level. So we could start with this so greatly with changing this and it would be worthwhile because so much greenhouse gas is produced. I'm, I'm with you. It's my topic, you know, but it's not our topic of today. Let me just say one thing. Everybody's speaking at the same time now, but what is important we cannot always take the level of information we have as the level of information of the general population. So even if we think that these structures are completely shitty, people won't go without meat just like this, although it would be an approach. I quite agree. I have Bernadette Brospin on the line now. And she can now speak. You're on, Bernadette. Now it's Wolfgang speaking. We're in front of the screen together. And I've just entered this question on the Q&A function. It is a big question to me, which we discussed last night as well, which is how do people, how are people taken along in our society? I mean, we heard it in the discussion yesterday, the political People, Van der Leyen was quoted several times. A lot is being done in politics out of fear of communism or right-wing radicalism. Uh, and with the governments emerging all over Europe, and the common denominator was fear tends to lead to radicalization, to communism, right-wing radicalism, fascism. So what paths? And what processes should be initiated? What could be the instruments for getting into a discourse about climate? May I ask you a follow-up question? The approach which we've just had towards the end. We're talking about your food and how it's produced. And this is the approach. Would this be a way for you for involving people more? I suppose it would be one kind of an approach. Yes, it certainly would be one approach at an individual level to get started with a discourse which could 
happen within families and within neighborhoods. But I'm afraid uh, it's still a bit too small scale. I have some insights in trade union movements and in my active working life. I was on the Works Council, so I know from the union what fears there are in workforces and how little is being communicated and discussed in this respect. So the big question is how to create forums and access so that a great number of people are enabled to think about the future at all. I mean, this Fridays for Future movement, which speaks to many people, is very encouraging, of course, but let me put it this way. I would wish that in the future we would be getting just as much scientific input and could give as many forums to science as is now happening with the virologists in the COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Moritz, somebody else? There is Pia who can speak now and also switch on her camera if she wants. Pia, please. Yeah, sorry, I can't switch on my camera. The host apparently stopped it, but you can hear me, great. I just wanted to ask a very brief question. Even though capitalism doesn't necessarily need exploitation, really, we've still massively profited from it. Only because of that exploitation did we obtain growth. And this kind of thinking, this target-oriented, rational, calculating way of going about it, if I think of Marx and Weber here, this re of this rational capitalism, that is just firmly anchored. So even if we were able to shrink that growth, even if it was feasible in some way, which is absolutely utopian and unrealistic given the power structures in place, isn't it true that still everywhere attempts would be made to keep up rationalism, to keep up profit and efficiency in such a way that it would still be the same, profiting from it, same people profiting from it who've profited for centuries. Even if we as a society question our consumption, if we change our consumption habits, isn't it still these powerful, large, great, big actors who still keep up these structures or have them kept up deliberately and intentionally through corruption, through this rational approach, which leaves us as a society simply way too weak. That's really my question. What can we do? If, if there were so many social movements and if there was a massive change in consumption habits, wouldn't it be up to the industry and economy to make changes? Wouldn't it have to be politics to compete with industry and economy? Because politics are also a very strong such actor. Is it really possible? And just meat consumption, just briefly, as an example. The vegan movement, so many people changing their eating habits. I mean, families with many children who don't earn a lot of money, who are caught in this repetitive wheel, who have factory jobs, who are single parents, who want to give and offer their children meat because they believe it's good for them, although the meat they can give them is no longer good. The mass um, animal... Um, production is not actually good for our organism, but they still presume meat is healthy and it's kept so cheap as long as they don't really know what kind of meat they're eating and feeding their children. It's utopian, isn't it? With the structures being kept up as they are. Okay, if you want to hear an answer, you have to stop talking now. <laughs> we have five minutes left. At least if we want to end on time. Okay, may I say one thing then, says Ulrike. Pia and also Wolfgang, uh, your two contributions fit in very nicely with each other. Wolfgang explained, and I'll believe that right away, that in companies there is enormous fear about of the job being lost. That's exactly what I try to describe, that any change that we would need would immediately cause that kind of fear. And that goes to show that Pia, in her description, is right and then also not right. She's right in saying that there's a lot of exploitation containing capitalism. That's no denying that. But unfortunately, it's not as if it was the entrepreneurs on the one side and the workers on the other or the employees on the other. Quite on the contrary, you can always see that live and in place. 
the trade unions and the employers are in the same boat when it comes to preventing climate protection or making it very expensive. Best example, the opt-out of coal production. It was the trade union who, along with the energy produ producing companies, was fighting the same battle in order to save their own jobs. And that will always be the case. To give a concrete example, really, to be aware of what kind of challenges we are confronted with here. If we had a climate neutral economy here, then, for example, one question would be, in very concrete terms, what would Baden-Württemberg, the federal state, live off? Because at the moment, we all know that's the home of the German automotive industry. And that's a question that would affect everyone in Baden-Württemberg and not just the Daimler-Benz shareholders. The employees, the workforce, the shops around the corner who live off the Daimler-Benz employees and so on. Or Medico International, you're located in Frankfurt. If we had a climate neutral economy, Frankfurt would be gone, would be bankrupt. All of the insurances, the banks, the um, lawyers, they you could forget them. Nobody needs them anymore. Then what would the Rhine-Main area around Frankfurt live off? Internet, says Florian. <laughs> no, seriously, with any attempt of making the economy climate neutral, you can certainly say that the entire region around Frankfurt, and it's not just the shareholders, but everybody who lives there, would be taking to the streets. So, it's always worth talking about injustice in capitalism. It's true. It exists. There is exploitation. But it's not as if the structural change was failing just because of the wealthy ones. And that's exactly what Wolfgang says, and he's absolutely right there. And I believe that getting everyone on board will work because climate change will affect everyone. If there's anybody who believes climate change is taking place somewhere else and not with me, that's absurd. Then we wouldn't be talking about this at all. Nina. Right, thank you. What Ulrike just outlined, I fully agree with, and I just want to open up another perspective. One of the French thinkers, such as Chartouche, he said that we colonialized our imaginary. And what it is also all about, that's what the entire conference is about, is how can we actually imagine a better future? Because we, if we can't even imagine it, it's never going to happen and then we, no one's going to fight for it. And that's why I think it's important to liberate our thinking and to really question our basic assumptions. And one of them is the homo economicus, the rational person, rational man, we all do that in a certain way. We very much distinguish in our relations with others what apparently is good for us. And that, I think, is important. If we talk about that kind of change, we need to also talk about our capacity to relate, also to relate to the rest of the world. And it's not something you can explain economically and with statistics and so on. That's a great many of you said. What well, I'll be taking from this discussion is that uh, you've all been really given some food for thought. The chat was really busy, busy, busy. So that I find hopeful. You've all realized it's worth thinking about post-growth. And uh, that certainly inspired me, and I certainly thank you for it. Yes, Florian says thank you to everyone, also Ulrike and also Moritz, for at least bringing in some of the input from the chat. Unfortunately, it was very limited time, but I hope it's, yeah, indeed, given a lot of food for thought, and I certainly believe that. I had a look at the chat earlier, and there's a massive discussion going on there, which I think is great. And that's really the reply to what Wolfgang said. How can we get the people on board? At times of COVID, for example, with formats like this one here, organized by Medico. There's a break now, and we'll continue with lecture two at 12.25.